great is this place? It's fantastic. I reckon Darcy and I could live here. <laughs> you kind of say that about every place that we go to. Mm. What would Darcy do without his mates in the city? Ah, uh, yes, true. Anyway, for you guys at home, we've got a feature-packed show with all the usual tips and travel advice. Plus, we're going to introduce you to some really important dogs that look after a penguin colony. Mm, so get comfy, sit back and enjoy the show. <coughs> Outside of Port Phillip Bay, Warrnambool is Victoria's largest coastal city. Now you could be forgiven for thinking it's just a sleepy little town. It's quiet, it's pretty, I think it's got a lot more going on than what we think. And Darcy and I are pretty excited to check it out, aren't we Darcy? Yes we are. That's the voice I reckon he'd have. It's considered a city, but with around 60,000 people spread across a wide area, it's more like a big country town. It was settled in the mid-1800s, and it boomed during the gold rush that spanned the second half of the century. As a result, there's some stunning colonial architecture, as well as a botanic garden, designed by the same guy that did the one in Melbourne. It's an historic and growing settlement that sees some 700,000 tourists visiting every year. There's a thriving public art scene here, and it's all encouraged by the local council. All around the place, there are amazing murals and works of art, and each one has its own story. Now, Darcy and I, we're going to try and see as many of them as we can. Aren't we, Darcy? The thing is, Darcy probably knows more about art than I do. Come on, buddy. A stroll around town searching for the art is a fun way to explore the area. There's a great website that has all the details of where to find them and a story on each piece. It's warnablestreetart.com. Oh, this could be your favourite. It's a big seal. Oh, you probably just think it's a big dog, don't you? Hold on, I want to look. It's pretty cool. Looks like you, only from the ocean. I suppose they do call seals dogs of the ocean. Come on, buddy. Darcy, what do you reckon about this one? No, keep going. All right, okay, let's go. Not keen on the mosaic? Come on, buddy. What do you want to see now? Mural or some kind of other artwork? There are weird, wonderful, and downright impressive works of art all over the place. They've been Fussy created today, by locals as well as visiting artists who have been given a wall or path as a canvas ah, to create their magic. Jellyfish down the end. You could right. easily spend the best part of a day walking from piece to piece, stopping at one of the many pet friendly cafes along the way for a rest and a bite to eat. Unfortunately, there was no resting for us. Darcy was on a mission. This is stunning. Now I won't pronounce the Aboriginal name because I'll just muck it up, but it means the welcome mural and it incorporates information about specific cultural sites as well as the local indigenous population. This would be my favourite piece of art I've seen today. It's beautiful. Hello and welcome to your Meet the Maremma experience. My name is Trish, this is John and this is Tom and today we're going to talk to you about the Middle Island Project. So why is this project so important? Yeah, so it's really important because we went from over 500 penguins down to just four. Wow. So we had our colony absolutely decimated by mm. foxes. Obviously now we have a locally endangered penguin population. Yes. So it's really important, particularly for us as a community, that the colony continues. Of course. And how did the dogs help and, and how did it begin really? It began because there was a chicken farmer named Swampy and he'd been using Maremas to protect his chickens for many mm -hmm. years. He also had a research student out at Deakin University, David Williams, who was working on his chicken farm and they got together and were chatting about the project and Swampy said, well you need a couple of marimbas on the island. After all, penguins are just chickens in fancy dinner suits. <laughs> and so that's how this crazy idea started to use marimbas, a guardian breed that's mm. been used for thousands of years to protect livestock, well, why can't it be used to protect our penguins? And what's the difference between Amor then and the dogs on the yeah, island? That's a great question. We have our guardian dogs mm -hmm. and then our ambassador dogs. Okay. So the guardian dogs are the ones that work on the island. They're bonded to their trainers and they're also, to a certain extent, they're socialised with people mm -hmm. so that they won't see them as a threat, but they're not bonded to them because we want them to do their job. Okay. The ambassador dogs, it's their whole job is to love people and Amor's trying to come over to yeah. me now. Hi buddy! Hi. So this is Amor. Hi. So he's three and Darcy. he's one of our ambassador dogs which Can as you can Darcy? tell <laughs> loves people. And how is the program operated and supported? Yeah so I mean it's something that we do have to do a lot of fundraising for so the actual tours 
raise a lot of our money for this project and also donations. But we do have support from the Warrnambool City Council mm -hmm. and we have a number of sponsors. So one of the huge ones is Warrnambool Pet Stock. Mm -hmm. So they provide all of the food for all six Maremmas for us for free. Oh, so this means about $10,000 a year for us. But we also have at one of our local vets, the vet group supplies all of the vaccinations, flea and worming treatments, all sorts of things for us for free. And we have a number of other supporters as well. Oh, yeah. great. And also the Ambassador Dogs make an appearance at the Warrnambool Pet Stock store, don't they, from yes. time to time? Yeah, so we have four um, pet stock in-store visits each year. So we try to make sure that they're on school holidays so that we can get the most number of people out there. So we'll take Avis and Amor, so both of the Ambassador Dogs out there, so that people can meet them for free, they can learn some more about the project, and hopefully while they're in store, they'll buy something for their own pet. Yeah, lovely, great. Well, if you miss out on a tour when they're not operating, do check out your Facebook page yes. and also uh, call the local pet stock store and see when you can come visit one of the Ambassador Dogs. Absolutely. Thank you, Trisha. Good luck with the project. Thank awesome. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. While Lara's off checking out the Maremmas, I thought I'd go for another walk with Darcy. So we decided to come down to the foreshore so we can go for a walk and check out the promenade. And if Darcy's a good boy, I might get myself an ice cream. Nah, you can have an ice cream too, Darcy. Unless, of course, you're lactose intolerant. And then, no ice cream for you. It seems that the number one thing I get to do when traveling with a pooch is go for scenic walks. Now, don't get me wrong, I absolutely love it. My only worry is that I'm wearing out little Darcy. Mind you, he's generally the one leading the way most of the time. He is a fit little guy. Oh, Das, look, that's where your mum is. She's checking out those dogs. Huh, oh, pit stop. This particular stroll goes from the breakwater in town along the foreshore walk that follows the beach all the way to the Logan's Beach whale watching platform. It's about five kilometres one way. Thankfully, Lara was going to pick us up at the other end. The great thing about this route is that you've got the pet friendly pavilion cafe at the start. Then along the way, there's bubblers, bathrooms, and plenty of distractions, including whales. <laughs> Thank you. No, you're talking about Darcy. Right. From June to September, this is the prime location to see female southern right whales who visit the area to calve. Unfortunately for us, there were none in town at the time, but that just gives us an excuse to visit again. If you're thinking of coming to Warrnambool, the summer months and school holidays are the busiest, so make sure you book well in advance. But in the middle of the year, it's a lot quieter, particularly if you can manage to skip out of work and come midweek. The awesome thing about visiting in the cooler months is not only the whales, but the cosy nights. Now, I know most of you probably like a warm summer day on the beach, but I've always loved the cold and moodiness of winter. Oh, look at this view. Come here, I'll pick you up. You can have a cup a look. Ah. Look at that, mate. Sorry, I got you. Look at that view. This is awesome. Look at you, you walked all the way over there to here. This is spectacular. Oh, Lara would have loved this. Should we head back? Go and see mum? You want to walk? Or you want me to carry you? All right, carry you it is. When considering what choice of dog we're going to get, it is really important we take into consideration their breed and what they're bred for, and also our own lifestyle. I have known a few people to have a Marama as a pet and they have all sorts of uh, behaviour issues, which is not surprising, is it Trish? No, not at all. <laughs> they are a guardian breed. Yes. So that means that they're going to bark all night. That's what they're bred for. Mm -hmm. And they need to have space. So yes. they really need something to protect. And they need at least five acres, really, if they're going to be doing their job properly. It's like any working breed, really, isn't it? Um, it's about understanding what a, a dog is bred for and then thinking about whether it's right for you. They're such a lovely temperament mm. dog, but they're just not for in town. Just because people complain about their barking and it's so instinctive in the Maremmas yes. that, you know, that's what they're bred to do. So it's not it's something that's very difficult to change. That's right. And we don't want more Maremmas going into rescue. No, exactly. And they're such a beautiful dog. Now, you've done the uh, NDTF course. 
Has this, how has this helped you? Was that part of your job that you wanted to understand them better? Yeah, so I'm about halfway through the course at the moment. So it's sort of something that I took on myself being the coordinator of the project and the main dog trainer. I've done a lot of dog handling and a bit of guardian dog training, but not so much actual obedience training. And as you can see from Avis, they are quite difficult to obedience train. Yes. And I wanted to get more um, ideas on how I can better train our ambassador dogs. Yes. So that when we have our tours, they're hopefully going to be a bit more behaved. <laughs> and understand, tap into what their natural instinct is, I guess, and how you can use that. Absolutely. So that's something that we can talk to people about. So the fact that they're aloof, that they're mm -hmm. really difficult to obedience train, you need to be a strong handler yes. and you really need consistency. So what's one of the biggest things you've learned outside of you know how to handle these guys from doing the course? Yeah, so I think that the best thing that I've learned is this thing called successive approximation. Mm -hmm. So you can just teach little, little bits yes. to end up with some really big, cool trick. Yes. But it's really breaking that down mm -hmm. into the smallest things and that the dog can deal with. So really, really listening to what your dog is telling you. Yes, I think one of the biggest mistakes people is we, we assume that dogs know what we want them to do, yes. whereas we actually need to break it down for them, make it really yeah. simple step by step yes. with the end goal in place, but yeah. not pushing them too fast to get to that end goal. Yes, and we want them to win. Yes, every time so we dog want up them to win. win. <laughs> yeah. And these guys have been set up to win. I mean, look where they get to live and work. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Trish. If you'd like to find out more about becoming a dog trainer, of course, so that you could potentially one day work with beautiful guys like this, visit the NDTF website. But for now, I reckon, Avis, you're ready. You want to go off and see your mates, don't you? You've got a job to do. <laughs> yeah. Good girl. Yeah, good girl. <laughs>Before joining Pooches at Play, I had no idea that you had to introduce a dog to a new diet slowly. Chris, why is that so important? Yeah, it's really important because we're really talking about the digestive process of the dog. Mm -hmm. So when we're, we're talking about digestion, we're really talking about the gut of the dog and, more important, the pH. A raw feed fed dog, the pH will sit at around 2, which is really quite acidic. A processed diet or kibble fed diet uh, will sit around 3.5 to 4 pH. So when you've got, you've got that difference there, it also affects the efficiencies of the digestive process. And also when you're feeding a raw food diet, most diets, such as the big dog diet, you know, we've got um, meat, we've got crushed bone, we've got ligaments and tendons, they're all part of that really important diet. And the, the lower the pH, the more effectively it can actually digest those, those raw materials, which are there for their nutritional benefits. How long should that transition take? can take anywhere from seven days to 14 days. And really, as the pet parent, it's your job to monitor that dog mm -hmm. and just and make sure that it's really quite a smooth transition for him. And it can be. Visually, this is what it should look like. Yep, absolutely. So what we've done is uh, seven, seven bowls here, which yep. is, let's say it's seven days, but it, each bowl could represent two days to blow it out to 14 days, okay, depending right. on how the dog is. Yep. So what I've done here is we've got a mixture of kibble and uh, some big dog um, patty here. Yep. But we're going to really treat this as a dog that's been on a kibble diet and we're the ultimate goal here is to get it onto a, a raw diet. Are there people that actually feed their dog just a kibble diet? There is. Right. Yeah. There is uh, a it's lot. A lot totally of, dry food. Yeah. A lot of people out there will be feeding dry. I didn't know that. Mm. So it's really quite important for these people, mm. these pet parents, that want to introduce raw to their diet to really, to, you know, concentrate on, or get this transition right. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't have to be scary or anything like no, that. No, it's right. just, it's just, this is the simplest way to make sure that we've effectively um, can ensure that the dog doesn't have any tummy upsets or anything like that. So that's what would happen if you went straight from like kibble to raw food. You're gonna, the dog's gonna be you go. sick. I was gonna say something else, but can, 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 can come out both ends. Is that what you're gonna say? I was gonna say that, but yeah, no, absolutely right. can. You worded it a lot better than <laughs> I was going to. That's exactly what can happen. They yeah. can, uh, and because, and again, it comes down to the acidity of the, the mm. stomach. Um, when they get that raw food, they can regurgitate. Yeah. It's natural, um, but we, we don't we don't really want them to have to do that. And the and can obviously also affect the other end as well. Yeah, which, which is we the won't go into messy end. So these are the ratios. So these are the ratios. So what we've done here, mate. This is an 80-20. Mm -hmm. So that's where we like to start. 80% yeah. of their original diet and 20% of the raw diet that you're trying to introduce. Yeah. Monitor the dog's stools mm -hmm. and also the well-being of the dog. Yep. Just make sure he's comfortable, he's still running around and he's behaving still the happy, same. Still yep. Exactly yeah. the same. If everything's yeah. cool, then we go to the 70-30. Mm -hmm. 
same thing. Yep. Monitor, 60-40, 50-50. Got it. 70-30? You got it. And 100? There. Yeah. Yep. And it's that simple. Okay. okay so the entire process, um, just as I said, monitor their stools, really quite important. And when I say monitor the stools, what we're looking for is the dog isn't straining. Okay. It's not being uncomfortable or anything yep. like that when it's going to the toilet. It's still regular. Okay. Okay. So that's really quite important. But other than that, it's, pretty it, it's really quite simple. But it's very important. We get a lot of questions about transitioning um, because, as I said, it doesn't have to be scary. Some people th really think it's, it's quite difficult, but it, it's, it's really that simple. Yeah, it's just 7 to 14 days, 80-20, work it through. Ultimate goal. Ultimate goal. Absolutely. I could do that. If I can do it, you guys can do that, no problem. Thanks, Chris. Well, I wanted to keep it simple. Laura actually mentioned to keep yeah, it simple. Yeah, she, she says that a lot to yeah. me all the time, yeah. Kiss, Fill me keep in. it simple. Yeah. <laughs> that and something about if you don't have enzymes, you die. Pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, she loves the enzymes. She does love enzymes. Mm. It's very important. For more information on transitioning your dog's diet, go to the Big Dog website. If you'd like to see more of the antics from Pooches at Play, then follow us online via Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. There's also a great website with loads of tips, training and travel ideas to help keep you and your pooch happy and healthy. You can even sign up to our e-newsletter to get special member-only offers. Just head to poochesatplay.com. Your yearly visit to the vet usually involves a vaccination booster and a discussion on heartworm, flea and intestinal worm prevention. Now, if you're going on holidays with your pooch, you really need to make sure that all of these things are up to date. For example, if you head up north, heartworm is much more prevalent than it is in Victoria. It's spread via mosquitoes and it can be fatal. If you head down south, Tasmania doesn't have any high dadded tapeworms, so you'll need proof that your dog has had the preventative medicine two weeks before you cross the border. So you might think that your pooch is pretty safe in your backyard, but when you head out and about, things can get pretty unpredictable. So it's better to be safe than sorry and have everything up to date. And to find out more on heartworm in particular, head to the Pooches at Play website. So Penny, what inspired you to start holidaying with dogs? Well, Holidaying with Dogs has actually been around for about 30 years, right. um, but it was a guidebook. Mm -hmm. And when we were starting up Holidaying with Dogs, we were thinking, um, how do we book holidays mm. and we don't use a book? So we really wanted it to be easy. So we've created the fully functional website where you can search for and book accommodation. And it's all about really companionship and fun and adventures with your dog. That's what everyone wants. And what makes you different to some of the other booking sites out there? Well, 100% uh, of our properties are pet friendly, mm -hmm. so that's great. You, you know that every property that you look at, yeah, you can take important. your dog to. Yes. And we created some really easy to follow icons because when we're searching, we want to know, can we have the dogs inside with us? Yes. That's really important. And is the, is the property fenced? So the icons really help define what what properties do have okay, um, make it easy. those rules and you can filter your searches by that as well. And we're a, a, a small business, Australian owned, and we really try and offer a personal service. So that's really important to us. And are there reviews and other information that people can get on the site? Yeah, that's right. We have a really special five paw rating that's based <laughs> on pet friendliness, people friendliness, location and value. So after everyone stays, they're mm -hmm. invited to provide a review for that. And we've got our awards coming up soon as well. Oh, great. And what are some tips if people are considering travelling with their dogs? You know, some things that really we should be aware of. Well, when you're when you've booked a holiday and you're mm. preparing to go, you should really think about what do you need to take for your dog. So uh, any of their favourite blankets from home or toys, dog bowls, um, treats, their lead of course, and poo bags is really important mm -hmm. yes. just to make them uh -huh. feel at ease when they arrive. And do different places have different etiquette and different rules? They do. So we find that when we get there, it's really important to familiarise yourself with the property. With Hazel, it's blind, mm. so particularly important for her to get the lay of the yes. land. So we often do a walk around, find a spot to put her water bowls and food bowls, usually take a mat to put that on. And really while you're there, it's really just being about observing the rules. So if hosts have those kinds of rules, they mm -hmm. will have outlined them on the website. And so it's just about, you know, common courtesy and following the rules where outlined. Yeah, so, yeah. being respectful and picking up after your dog. Yes, always. And where do you get the properties from? How did people know about them? 
Well, we had a lot of people who came across that were in the book. Um, we list properties all around Australia, but we're always looking for new properties. So mm -hmm. if you own one and you want to list, you can do it all yourself on the website. And if you've stayed at one or you know somebody who know, has stayed at a great property, send it through to us and we'll give them a call. Oh, fantastic. I mean, they are part of our family, so more and more people are wanting to take their pets away with them, aren't they? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Oh, well, and also you need to get a book in early, don't you? <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, even that's Christmas. right. You've got to book in for Christmas now. Yes, yeah. way ahead of time. So yeah. if you are looking to book your next pet friendly holiday, visit Holidaying with Dogs website and find the perfect place for you and your pooch of course, they're the most important ones aren't they? That's right. <laughs> Thanks Penny. Thanks Sarah. We all love to treat our dogs, but how much do we really know about the products we're feeding? When I'm choosing a dog treat, I want to make sure that the product is safe and has good quality ingredients. The ingredient list on the back of pack is a great place to start and I look for meat as the first ingredient. All treats need a preservative for product freshness, but rosemary and vitamin E are great natural alternatives. I love Vitapet chicken tenders. They have 97% real chicken breast, 3% natural preservatives, and only 1% fat, making them a healthy option for my best friend, Kelly. Would you like to win a Pawson Travel Pack valued at over $2,000 for you and your furry friend? One lucky viewer will win this great prize, including a $250 pet stock gift card and travel essentials bundle, a $300 Easy Dog Travel Pack, an Adaptor or Feel Away Calm Pack, a year's supply of Vita Pet Treats, and $500 worth of Big Dog Freeze Dried Bites and Snuffle Mat. Simply tell us one of the locations you've seen us visit during Series 4 and why you love travelling with your pet. It's that easy. Visit the Pooches at Play website to enter. Sit, good boy. Who would have thought that Warnable has so much going on? I know, and how smart are those Maramas? What an important job they have. Very important. Join us next week when we have as much fun as this episode, if not more. Yes, we are heading to Ballarat, the caravanning capital of Victoria. And I'm going to meet a dog that goes looking for gold with his family. Do you reckon it's like truffle hunting? No. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. No, no, I mean, like, does he go sniffing it out, like the gold, and then dig it up? I don't think so. I think you need a metal detector. Okay. Well, we'll find out next week, won't we? <laughs>